This session is being recorded. Hello, and welcome to the American Psychological Association series on careers in applied psychology. I'm Dr. Betsy Schoenfeld, a university distinguished professor and an industrial organizational psychologist at Western K Kentucky University. I'm representing the APA Office of Applied Psychology, and I'll be hosting this panel. Today, we have a very interesting and informative panel on careers in applied psychology. We're focusing on industrial organizational psychologists, and we have six panelists representing different career paths in industrial organizational psychology. First, we have Tyler Sally, who's the lead global talent management for Under Armour. Tyler will speak on his master's level practitioner role in global HR. Next, we have Sasha Horowitz, who's Senior Director of Talent Management at the NBA. Sasha will speak on her master level practitioner's role in HR. And next, we have Dr. Neil Morelli, Chief IO Psychologist for Cobility, who will speak on the doctoral level practitioner in HR technology and artificial intelligence. Ruth Frias will be next. She's the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager at NYU Langone Health. She will speak on her master's level role as uh, in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Then we have Dr. Izzy Diaz, who's assistant professor of biopsychology at California State University, San Bernardino. Izzy will speak on a faculty role in master's IO graduate programs. Last and certainly not least is Dr. Dorothy Carter, who's an associate professor of IO psychology at the University of Georgia. She will speak on the faculty role in doctoral IO graduate programs. I will start the panel with a brief overview of the field of IO psychology. We say IO psychology is science for smarter workplace. IO psychology is defined as the scientific study of work and the application of scientific knowledge principles in, to issues of critical relevance to business. IO psychologists use science and practice to improve well being and performance of organizations and the people who work in those organizations to achieve maximum work effectiveness. IO psychology includes workforce planning, employee selection, talent management, training, uh, leader development, job attitudes and motivation, work teams, diversity, equity and inclusion, and organizational change and development. So what exactly is IO psychology? Well, we say there's an I focus and an O focus. Industrial psychology is also called personnel psychology. And it includes practices to ensure employees can do the job. That is that workers have the knowledge, skills, and abilities, what we call KSAs, that enable them to do the job well. First step is typically a job analysis. IOs break down jobs into essential responsibilities and identify the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed to perform the job. For employee selection, IOs develop and validate instruments to identify the best job candidates from a applicant pool. In performance management, we develop tools and systems to ensure employees perform up to their potential. IOs develop training to ensure skills and competencies are current. And we increase diversity, equity, and inclusion and comply with EEO laws and guidelines to ensure valid and fair employment policies and practices. On the organizational side, IOs focus on practices to ensure employees will do the job. They focus on motivation and engagement. They examine attitudes such as satisfaction, commitment, and fair fairness to identify the causes of these important job attitudes and the outcomes or consequences of these attitudes for both the worker and the organization. IO psychologists engage in practices to ensure employee well being and work life balance. At the group level, we develop leadership skills and practices and help ensure optimal team and group dynamics. At the macro level, we help organizations grow and develop to meet the changing demands of a dynamic global economy and evolving technology, products, and services for our clients. So what kind of roles do IO psychologists fill in organizations? Well, they include many different roles and include many different job titles, such as you see here on the screen, including compensation and benefits, data analytics, organizational surveys, leadership development, professor, consultant, and occasionally we even go by the job title of IO psychologist. In fact, the variety of the work that we do and the variety of job titles for IO psychologists is one of the reasons many do not rec recognize the prevalence of IO psychologists in the workforce. Where, where will we find IO psychologists? Where do they work? Well, they work in business and industry for private sector and nonprofit organizations. They work in consulting firms specializing in activities we just mentioned. 
They work for the government and the US military and municipalities hiring and promoting police, firefighters and other first responders for state governments, for the federal government and agencies such as the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the CIA, the FBI and many other governmental organizations. They work in universities and colleges as faculty members in psychology and business where they teach and conduct research and likely consult with organizations as well. So you're probably wondering, what does it take to become an IO psychologist? Well, it requires postgraduate work. You need to earn either a master's degree or a doctoral degree. A master's degree will require two years beyond the undergraduate degree and usually involves completing a thesis or an internship. Um, master's level IOs work as practitioners in business, industry, government, and consulting. Those with a PhD require four to seven years of postgraduate work and have to complete a dissertation and perhaps an internship. Uh, these IO psychologists work as faculty in universities, researchers, or consultants. Regardless of where they work, IO psychologists positively impact the people and the organizations in which they work. Well, I hope that this overview of IO has provided some understanding of what IO psychology is and where IO psychologists work. And I hope that it's piqued your interest to hear from other IO psychologists about their careers. And our panel members will do just that. Our first panelist is Tyler Sally, the lead global talent management with Under Armour. One second, we might need to redo this because the lights just turned off because of a... Tyler. Hi everyone, my name is Tyler Sally. I am a lead on the global talent management team here at Under Armour. Um, I, I thought I'd maybe start today with just telling you a bit about my history and kind of how I ended up in this role. So uh, starting off in undergrad, I was a psychology major. And um, I think in that time, I was really trying to figure out what part of psychology I wanted to go into. Um, as you may know, or soon you will be learning that psych psychology is a really broad field and there's a lot of different specialties that you can take. Um, I had my fair share of internships. Um, I, I did some work in clinical psychology. Uh, I did an internship in behavioral psych and I initially went to college wanting to do forensic psychology, which is like criminal profiling and stuff. But, uh, you know, through those experiences, I really kind of found that um, those roles and, 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 and working in those fields either was something that was really uh, emotionally taxing where you're right, where, where you're working with uh, people as a therapist or in some kind of uh, addiction treatment capacity or um, it was just something where I didn't really feel very uh, empowered to make my own decisions. Um, my last internship I had in college was actually a business internship, and I was uh, a, a salesperson for a, a, a local marketing company. And I think that is when it kind of clicked in my mind that I liked a little bit of psychology work and I liked a little bit of business work. And I uh, then in my last college course, I actually took my first IO psychology class, and I wish I had taken it earlier. I was a uh, kind of upset that it waited until my last semester senior year to, to, to be a part of that uh, course. Um, since then, I started a, a career in, in HR, uh, which is a lot of times where IOs tend to be if they're working in more of a corporate larger uh, company. And uh, in that, I had a few different roles. I had worked on in more of a recruiting capacity where I was trying to bring in new talent, new, new employees to organization, working with hiring managers to really understand uh, what their requirements were, and of course, also looking through our entire workforce plan to see what's in the pipeline, what do we need to do, what does the future of our uh, workforce look like. Uh, from there, I liked a lot of things about that role. There are also a lot of things that I didn't like about recruitment. Um, I think I really like the ability to have a significant impact on someone. Uh, one of the biggest things that you can do uh, is to give someone a job that doesn't have a job, and as a recruiter, you got to do that. Uh, but some of the things that I wasn't too crazy about was just constantly being on the phone with people, bringing people in for interviews all the time. And that just that just wasn't that just wasn't for me. Um, but what, what I did find was that there was a way that I can have an impact on an organization and within a team, but not have to recruit them in. Right. I could work with the employees that are already here. So I, I then started uh, having some projects in what we call like organizational development where we're working to help uh, elevate employee uh, behavior, skills, teams, and, and, and overall just trying to improve the organization. Uh, through that work, I really started to find that I was more interested in talent management. 
engagement. We're interested in uh, organizational effectiveness. And, and these are terms that uh, essentially just talk about more specifically, what is the specific kind of IO work you're doing? And what is your, your kind of level of influence? Are you working at more of like a organizational wide level or if you're working at like an individual or team level? Um, so through that, I, I really kind of found that I really liked working with leaders and not executive leaders, but mid-level leaders within organizations. So what I do at Under Armour is I actually am in charge of all of the development for our senior manager and below global population. So that means our leaders that are in the US, leaders that are in our Amsterdam offices, uh, leaders that are in our uh, APAC offices, and really trying to figure out how do we develop and elevate these leaders consistently across the board. So that means that I have to be cognizant of cultural differences. I have to be cognizant of, uh, of communication. I have to be cognizant of how these things might show up differently in different locations, but it's work that I love. Um, something else that I do in my role is really uh, control and, and run our overall like Armor U platform, which is our internal employee development uh, platform that we have. So uh, making sure that we have offerings that align to our business goals that are all around our, our competencies uh, and that, that are aligned to a way that for us to actually be able to measure and look at the effectiveness of these competencies. So um, overall, you know, the thing that I really love about IEO and what really drew me to the field is just the ability to have this impact and ability to really think critically about human behavior. Uh, what you learn in grad school is you learn a bunch of models, a bunch of uh, data and, and just insights about how to do proper research, uh, the kind of like the gold standard and best practice. And as an IO practitioner, your role is to take that knowledge and create something for the organization that can not only just meet the scientific rigor that you learn in grad school, but also meet practical rigor that you need to uh, show a, a CEO or any VP or, or, or director the impact of, of what these different interventions that we do in the workplace psychology side are. So I hope that was helpful. I'm really looking forward to speaking with uh, and hearing from our other panelists here, and I wish you the best of luck in your decision. Thank you so much, Tyler. Our next panelist is Sasha Horowitz, Senior Director of Talent Management with the MBA. Thanks, Betsy. So uh, I originally got excited about industrial organizational psychology actually through my mom. So uh, my parents were outside a cul-de-sac when I was in high school um, and they were talking with one of my neighbors about what their kids were doing and what they were gonna major in in college. And they were talking about what one of the daughters was doing and my mom heard it and was like, wait, I've never heard of this, but this sounds exactly like what Sasha would enjoy doing. So my mom said, Sasha, I know you're thinking about going to college. I know uh, once you get there, you have to think about your major. Why don't you look into this psychology thing? And I was like, all right, I'll look into it because I had never taken it in high school. So I get to college, I look into psychology and I love psychology, but I realized very quickly, similar to what Tyler had mentioned, it, is, it can be very taxing. Um, and so I happened to come across one of the professors um, and she had a, a PhD in industrial organizational psychology. And um, she told me a little bit about her background, uh, some thesis she had written and some papers she was working on. And I decided to take an IO class, instantly fell in love. Um, I had changed my major already three times prior to that. So I had to play some catch up, um, but absolutely loved everything I was learning and realized if I was gonna take this seriously, I needed to go ahead and get a master's. So I immediately went and got my master's in IO psychology. Uh, and I thought I wanted to do external consulting. That's what I was like, okay, that's what you need to do. That would be a great path for me. So I ended up getting my master's and very right out of the gate, I was able to get um, uh, my entry level role uh, with an external consulting firm doing um, talent management and performance, different pieces of IO psychology. And I loved what I was doing, but I realized very quickly the downside to external consulting is that sometimes you go into different companies and help them with different projects across the IO world, um, but then sometimes you don't get to see it finish. And so something that I really enjoyed and something that's true to who I am is building those relationships with employees and with other people and seeing projects from start to finish. So I knew right away I loved what I was doing, 
but needed to be internal. So from there, I immediately realized I wanted to be an internal consultant, right? So across that IO world. Um, so I've been in a couple different companies now um, and I've landed now at the MBA. So what I really do at the MBA is talent management in its full entirety. So what that means is we look at DE and I pieces, we look at succession planning, we look at performance, we look at 360 feedback, goal setting, the list goes on and on. So what I'd love to do is kind of relate this back to the MBA and to the game, um, because I think that's the best way to kind of think about how we do these things, but in a more layman's fashion. So in the performance world, when someone talks about performance, they're really talking about goal setting. They're talking about um, how is someone uh, doing against their goals for the year? So the best way to think about that is an MVP in the league. So if a basketball player were to say, I wanna be the best player in the league, they're gonna set goals and different metrics that they wanna hold themselves accountable to throughout the year in order to become the MVP of the league, right? So that's the best way to kind of think about goal setting. When you think about feedback, and there's different kinds of feedback, but 360 feedback is a big one, is thinking about um, after a game, the players have a game, and then they sit down usually with their coach and with their other players, and they start reviewing highlights of the game. What did they do well? Where passes did they miss, right? Instead of taking the shot, could they have passed it off to a colleague or a, a fellow player, right? So these are different ways to think about the the impact you're making as you make a decision or as you're carrying out a project or as you're doing anything inside that game or in business. Another piece is development plans, which I think is super important. So a way to think about this is how does an employee go from being maybe a coordinator all the way up to the CEO, if that's their, their future dream in the company, right? So I like to think of this as the how, what are the resources that an employee is going to use to get there? So another way to think about this is maybe you have a college basketball player and they want to one day get to the NBA. Well, what do they need to do, right? So what are the different kinds of skills and uh, key you know, drills they might need to practice on to get to that developmental league? Then after that developmental league, they might have their eyes set on the draft. How do they make sure that they're known and, and people will recognize them for the draft? And once they get into the draft and they become part of the NBA, even then, how do they get on the best team, right? How do they become the captain of the team? Those are great ways to think about developmental plans. And the last piece I'll touch on is talent. And that's my true passion, which is really trying to find the best fit for someone inside of an organization and what they're doing. So I love talking to people and understanding what do they like doing? What don't they like doing? Uh, and that way we can understand what are the skills that they have and what are the areas that they can develop to then get into those roles that they truly want. So another way to think about this is um, two pieces. One of them is those high potentials, those stars, who are the best players, right? So if you think about it, um, you might have players who could be the captain of the team or maybe some big name players. And then when you think about sponsorships and contracts they get outside of the league, those external companies wanna work with them because they're some of the best players, right? So that's a good way to think about it. And then the, ex the last piece I'll get to is succession planning, which I love thinking about. So. If you have a, a, a C-suite at the top of an organization and they're going to retire, maybe they win the lottery, right? Or maybe they want to leave and go to another organization. How are we preparing so that the organization and the company doesn't feel the impact of them leaving, right? So what are we doing for that employee to make sure that they are ready to take on that CEO role or take on that VP role? So another way to think about this is your backup players for the game, right? So if someone gets injured in a game, who's going to take over their spot? We need someone prepared and ready, right? If you think about those developmental leagues, we have people who are preparing to take over that, that spot so that um, the team can keep going and maybe win a championship. So I know those were silly analogies, but I think it, it's a best way to kind of think about how we do what we do. And I'm also doing it at the NBA. So thank you. And I look forward to hearing from everybody else. Thank you so much, Sasha. Our next presenter is Neil Morelli, Chief IO Psychologist for Codility. Thanks, Betsy, and it's good to see everybody. Um, my name is Neil Morelli. I'm the Chief IO Psychologist at Codility. And if you haven't heard about Codility before, we are a pre-hire assessment platform for software engineering jobs. Uh, so in other words, we test coders on their skills and technologies like Python, JavaScript, and we give companies like Microsoft, Twitch, Tesla, the data that they need to know who to hire. So you can kind of think of Codility like uh, the blind addition on The Voice or maybe the 40 yard dash in the NFL Combine, uh, but with developers and technical skills. 
So what does an IO psychologist do at a company like Codility? Well, I, I see myself as really the go-to expert when it comes to any questions about the science of testing, testing people for jobs. We're a testing company, we sell tests. So I do a lot of different things. I support the sales team, I create marketing content, I answer customer questions, um, but I really report into the product team and help us build new tasks, new tests, new scoring um, methodologies, new reports. And really the way I kind of look at the overarching mandate for my role is to make sure that our tests are reliable, valid, and fair. So the types of questions that I answer are, do we measure skills consistently from moment to moment, from person to person? Uh, what evidence do we have that shows our scores mean what we think that they mean? If you get a good score on say a Python test, does that actually mean that you're gonna perform well as a coder if you get into the job? And then finally, are our tests biased against anybody and uh, any groups in particular? So these are the questions that I think about and the ones that I'm tasked with answering. And I work with several groups in our organization to answer those. Uh, but how did I get into a company like Codility? I know I have somewhat of a unique role. Well, like some of the others that you've heard already is um, I started as an undergrad, uh, just like you, uh, thinking about what did I want to do? Um, I thought I might want to own my own business or uh, kind of get into the business world, but then discovering psychology, I thought, okay, the scientific study of people is pretty cool. Uh, how could you apply that? Well, finding IO psychology is really the blend of both of those worlds. And uh, first starting out with a master's, a two-year master's program at UTC in Chattanooga, and then doing the PhD at UGA, I really learned the theory and the research skills. So if you're in a research methods class right now, pay attention because those skills will really serve you well as you go forward. Um, but then that led to an internship with APT Metrics, was an ION consulting firm, where I really learned product, uh, project management, consulting acumen, uh, these types of things uh, that got me noticed by a pre-hire assessment software company called Logiserve, uh, leading to a executive search firm uh, that was based in San Francisco, where I learned all about uh, software sales, business growth strategies, product development, the testing industry that turned into a leadership role at another pre-hire assessment software company called Burke, which was closer to home. Um, but hopefully you can see some of the skills and some of the experiences that lend themselves well to the type of role that I have now and, and things that you might be interested in developing and growing in yourself. But for where you're at right now, for what you're thinking about, here's the question that I want you to, to, to answer. What questions do you want to answer? What are the things that you're interested in from a question standpoint? You don't have to come up with the answers right now. Just think about the questions that are intriguing and interesting to you. For me, uh, for my dissertation, at least it was, how do mobile devices affect how people take tests? And so really seeing that intersection between technology and talent acquisition and recruiting was what set me on the path that I'm at today. But um, as you're thinking about this, uh, here are some things that I, I thought uh, I would share about the things that I love about my job and my career path. And if these are interesting to you, maybe uh, this is a career path to consider. Uh, but the first one is you might be interested in a career path like this if you want to help get people matched to the right job. That's essentially what we do. Uh, we want to look at the capabilities that people need to have and then the people, the capabilities that they have and then see how well those things are matched together. It's a really fascinating question and it really makes a big impact on people's lives. Uh, it might be interesting to you if you want to work in innovative products and services that bring the science to bear. Uh, I love all the academic research and I stay close to it, but I really love seeing that worked out in the field with the, the businesses and the people that we work with. So seeing the, the practice uh, at life is really important. And then you want to help businesses succeed. So uh, I really get excited by our customer base and all the interesting problems that they're solving and to know that we're adding engineering capacity and capability to them is really fascinating. So I hope that's interesting and helpful for you as well and happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Our next speaker is Ruth Frias, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager with NYU Langone Health. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Betsy. So my name is Ruth Frias. My pronouns are she, hers, ella. If you've never seen the ella part, I identify as Afro-Latinx, and it's a way to just let folks know that I am Hispanic. In terms of what I do, I am the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Mouthful. DEI Program Manager for NYU Langone Health. But before I get into that, I wanna show a little bit about how I got here today. So my path was a little non-traditional. 
Prior to being a program manager today, I was a teacher. So I taught middle school science for a couple of years. Then I was a facilitator with Teach for America. I did DI, um, teaching and coaching and mentoring. And then from there, I pivoted to customer service at an ed tech company, which leads me to where I am today. I highlight this because each of these roles prepared me and really enhanced the skills that I learned in a, my master's program for IO Psych. So thinking about today, so what do I actually do? I broke it down to four different components. First things first, I'm someone who examines and really takes a look at the workplace culture and the trends. This is something that I, I feel like a lot of people underutilize and it's, it happens naturally, organically in everyday life. So what do you see happening in the cooler conversations in the office? Where are the clicks happening? Who is most likely to get most emails and why? who's assigned projects and who is not. And then collecting all of that data to then analyze it and interpret it to display to other folks. Next is designing. So I'm someone who loves to break things apart, build things. And that's one of the, like, the best parts of my role because I get to design programs based on the data and the analysis from the workplace culture and trends. And when folks come to my department and say, hey, we're noticing this thing, this problem, what do you suggest, how can you support? From there, I design programs, events like luncheons or DI trainings that cover things like unconscious bias and mentorship and hiring and all the other things that involve workplace policies and practices. The third thing is implementation. So this is one of the things that I really took away from grad school is now that you've designed this pretty awesome program or plan this event, how do you actually run the thing? What are the pieces that are required to make sure that it functions well and that people know what is happening? So these are things like applying research-based best practices and launching the programs that fall within an appropriate timeline or um, space, keeping in mind what is happening in the world, in society, all of that must be considered as you're planning your events. And then the fourth big bucket of what I do is evaluation. So after all the planning and implementation, I have to then assess, did it go well? Was this something that was effective? Did people like it? What did they like? What didn't they like? And what would we do differently next time? So this really goes back to the examining data after you've collected all of it. And after you have all of those steps completed, you have to present the data to the teams. So when we are launching programs, you have to keep in mind, what are the things that we are going to keep in mind in a back pocket for next time. What things are we going to scrap and how do we show superiors or other department leaders what to do based on the events that we have hosted. So now, how did IO Psych prepare me for all of this? First things first, leveraging all of the data. I mean, before grad school, I hated math and statistics, but through my master's programs, I learned to appreciate it because it makes my job a lot easier. And it's not just quantitative data, it's qualitative. So what are things that you're observing? How do you collect the data? What is the, the appropriate method to use? And then how do you present the data to folks that were like me that didn't really like it? The next big thing is relationship building. If nothing else, Psychology is people-centered. It is thinking about and prioritizing the people experience, group dynamics, all of that comes into place. And you're probably already doing that in high school and undergrad. Might not make a job out of it. And the third thing, thinking about the tools and resources. So Tyler mentioned this earlier and like Sasha touched upon it as well. What are some of the methodologies? What are some things that you can do to ensure that the practices that you are implementing, the proposal you're making, and the problem solving approach is valid, it's reliable, and it's actually going to be useful to the folks that you're presenting it to. And then if you really want to see, okay, is DEI something that fits my personality? Do I wanna do this? Here are some of my focus areas. I always think about power dynamics in any space that I am in. Who are the leaders in the room? Who do I need to get on board first so that my practices can actually be implemented and that folks can minimize the pushback? Because it's gonna happen. I also really think about diversity in the org structure. So when I look at an org chart, who are the folks at the top? Is there diversity there? And if there isn't, why not? What is the organization doing to rectify that? And what are they not doing? Providing equitable access for all. So different than equality, 
equity is just making sure that all folks have what they need and tailor to them to succeed in the workspace. And above all, feelings of belonging. It really feels awful when you feel like you are the outsider in your workspace or in high school, wherever you are right now. So it's important to create or foster these feelings of welcome and belonging. And you can feel psychologically safe in the workspace. So in sum, my big advice to you, based on my trajectory and where I started, honing your passions. Right now is a perfect opportunity to think about what ignites you, what are your passions, what are things that you love doing and what don't you love doing? And keep an open mind. Y'all saw I was a teacher, I had the customer service, I, I'm a career changer. But that's what helped me be the best self and the best professional in my current role because I have so much experience and I didn't limit myself to just one thing. Psychology is very broad and you can do just about anything with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Next is Izzy Diaz, Assistant Professor of IO Psychology at California State University, San Bernardino. Hello, hi everyone, thank you for having me. Um, so I think like some of the other speakers, my interest in IO began in undergrad. Uh, our university only offered one class. I took it and I learned as much as I could. I was in my third year and so I, I really had to get the ball rolling in terms of grad school. So when I ended up choosing IO, it was because it was a kind of like an earlier panelist said, I wanted to help people, but not necessarily invest in kind of the one-on-ones. IO was very appealing to me because it's very system oriented and it's very much the idea that every ship rises with the tide. And so if you create a system that's fair, that's valid, that's measuring what it's supposed to, free of bias, free of all these problems, then you end up with a much more equitable and fair world as a result. Um, so I wanted, to, I, I wanted to do that. And so I ended up getting my master's and PhD right out of undergrad. And I kind of took the risk and said, you know what, let's try IO, see what happens. And it worked out. Um, so I earned my master's and PhD at Texas A&M, um, and then as part of that, I, my first job um, as a professor, I, I liked what I did and I really enjoyed teaching, but I also found this need to kind of apply my skills. And so one thing I began doing that I still do now is I, with myself and my students, we will do these consulting projects with nonprofits pro bono. So we go through the process of negotiating a contract. We essentially have them budget like what they would pay us. And then we, again, all of this is developmental. Um, so what I love about um, IO psychology is that it's very scientist practitioner oriented. And as you heard from our previous uh, speakers, they're all scientists. They're, they're trained as scientists. They're thinking like scientists. And so I always wanted to do research in the academic context but I also love that in IO, you can do things like these applied projects. My professors, they were really good at what they did so they could do it for money. You know, I just humbly offer my services for free. Um, and so what this means then is as a professor in our master's program, we train our students in coursework around statistics, research me and measurement. As you heard from uh, all of the other panelists, IO psychology is an evidence-based practice degree in the sense that everything we do is based on evidence, both qualitative and quantitative. So you have to not only collect information about people and score their responses, but as other speakers have said, you have to talk with them. You have to see what they're doing as they're working, understand the context in which they're working. And so the, the grad students in our program, the, I think of them as like little anthropologists. They're learning how to observe people, how to interact with them, how to understand the, them as if they were a family or a little society. And as part of that, using evidence and that qualitative component, really deciding um, how do I help these folks um, develop systems that when I'm gone, they'll still be in place. And so one of the maxims I think of IO is that you work yourself out of a job. And so with the other speakers, uh, this is something that our students also experience is that you need a lot of different skill sets. You need to learn how to understand people, how to quantify things statistically and mathematically. So in our classes, we have uh, classes, in, and this is true for most IO programs, uh, on test and measurement, so developing and writing items based on surveys and based on things that you observe, how to say for sure that a score on this exam, as, as we said earlier, is actually going to relate to performance at work. And so I use the example of when a company might require a high school diploma, 
That diploma is supposed to represent knowledge and general abilities, but if it's in a district, for example, with a high um, you know, disproportionate enforcement of rules towards students of color, then that diploma as a score doesn't represent knowledge, skills, and abilities. It represents the racist choices that were made by other people. And so again, if we're trying to figure out how would we fix that? Well, if the idea is that certain knowledge, skills, and abilities that you learned in high school prepare you to you know, work in this job, don't assume that a GRE or a diploma will get you that, sorry, GED. Um, what you really have to do is test those employees. And so again, this is an example of a classic case of Duke Power where the company lost because they used an indicator that was contaminated by something else. And so the goal of my, myself as a professor is to teach students how to think like a researcher, how to understand what something means and make better choices from that. Um, our alumni, we've had a whole bunch come through our program. Um, and so just to list a few, we have one who recently got a job for the city of LA in the school districts, head of HR um, as an example. Um, and then as part of the, the cool thing about IO is not everyone ends up in a necessarily traditional IO job. So one of our alumni, for example, she works for the housing authority of the state of Oregon and she does the grant writing. So whenever the state of Oregon applies for you know, money to help with homelessness or improve the quality of life of people, she has to create the metrics that will determine did quality of life improve. So evaluating data like how many people applied for you know, low income assistance, how many people actually successfully uh, got assistance, and then also follow up outcomes like uh, quality of life, employability, using all of that data to help the, the state and the federal government use their grants better. Um, another one of our alumni works uh, actually in a similar position um, as Ruth, working in diversity inclusion for Kaiser Permanente. And so he gets to do similar things, talk to different stakeholders, understand what different employees deal with in terms of their experiences and kind of teach the organization how to see its own blind spots and as part of that process, make the organization more inclusive. So my role as a professor in a master's program is to give students the tools to kind of figure out what they want to do. And then as part of that too, to also help them think through what they want to be when they grow up. So I have my students think, okay, picture yourself five years from now, 10 years from now, what are you doing? Are you behind a desk? Are you in the field observing people? Are you crunching the numbers? Are you coordinating other people and what they're doing? And then based on their answers, myself and the other faculty can tell them, oh, we'll focus on this thing, you know, apply for this internship, take these classes, maybe think about these ideas for your thesis. Um, and so again, for, for those of us who are professors, part of the joy is seeing students uh, get the skills they think they want, <laughs> but also grow as people and figure out, oh, even though I like this, I'm actually better here. And so part of the joy of my job is helping people not only find their talents, but also hopefully their calling and just the idea that, again, this is a marathon, not a race, and you have to pace yourself and find something that you love and be good, good at it and be prepared for it um, as part of that process. Okay, thank you so much, Izzy. Yeah. Our final panelist is Dorothy Carter, Associate Professor of IO Psychology at the University of Georgia. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Dorothy Carter, an Associate Professor of IO Psychology at the University of Georgia. And I've been really intrigued to hear all of the different interesting panelists' career paths and uh, professions right now. Just to give you some insight into what my job is, as an Associate Professor at a research-focused institution like University of Georgia, my primary job is to actually conduct research. So conduct uh, research that can be turned around and published in peer-reviewed journals, and also to secure grant funding to support my research program. And so when uh, someone has a, a research-focused job, it's usually a taking a deep dive into a specific area of research, which I'll get to, into here in a second. But in addition to my responsibilities as a researcher, I also mentor PhD students. Uh, so that's actually a kind of a long-term relationship. Every PhD student that I mentor it's kind of a commitment on both parties 
uh, that we're going to work together for five years, maybe longer after they graduate. In addition to mentoring PhD students, I also teach PhD and level and master's level classes, as well as undergraduate classes like social psychology and teams in the workplace, leadership. Uh, I also engage in service to the university, so things like sitting on committees, contributing to leadership decisions at the university and across my field. But like all the other panelists, I really consider myself a scientist practitioner. So that's kind of the identity of an IO psychologist. And what that means is that in addition to conducting academic research that's publishable and that sort of thing, I also really appreciate the opportunity to apply my findings to real organizations and work with you know, corporations or other government institutions uh, to see the translation of our science to practice and kind of make the workplace a better place. And I have a sort of strange career trajectory. So I'm from Houston, Texas originally, and I was not necessarily convinced about going to college at all. <laughs> in fact, I was exclusively interested in becoming a professional ballet dancer. And I did that for a few years, uh, kind of between high school and college. But I realized that that was not necessarily the career path I wanted to pursue long term. And through this ballet career, I ended up in several different states, the, the last one being Ohio. And I was lucky enough to attend Wright State University, which had an open door policy for someone like me, a non traditional student that didn't necessarily go right. I did not go from high school to college directly. Uh, so Wright State University had this open door policy. And then my second major strike of luck is that I strike of luck is uh, I was introduced to my undergraduate thesis advisor, Dr. Deborah Still Johnson, who is an IO psychologist as well. And she really mentored me through the research process, kind of like learning what that meant, uh, how to get into graduate school. So these were questions that I had, you know, no answers for before meeting with Wonderful Woman. And then after that, I uh, did go to a PhD program, met a, another amazing mentor, my PhD advisor, Dr. Leslie De Church at Georgia Tech. And more recently, I've been at the University of Georgia since 2015 as an assistant professor, and then now as an associate professor. Had another great chance to work with uh, my kind of faculty mentor here, Dr. Lillian Eby. And these wonderful mentors kind of have guided me through my career path. But I, where that has led me at this point is I direct what's called the Leadership Innovation Networks and Collaboration Laboratory. It's a research laboratory at the University of Georgia. Uh, and my lab aims to better understand, I conduct research on how to enable leaders, teams, and actually larger systems composed of multiple teams. Uh, how do we enable these, these collectives to tackle big challenges in contexts including the military, medicine, corporation, scientific research, deep space, deep space exploration. And the reason why I study this is many of the challenges that we're facing as people, as societies, as organizations are requiring teamwork and it's requiring teamwork on a big scale. So things like global pandemics, you know, emergency response, uh, military endeavors in the 21st century. They're requiring a lot of collaboration, maybe even more than we've experienced in the past. And unfortunately, we also know based on research and this kind of personal experience that teams often fail to live up to their potential. So one of the, the major questions driving my research program is how can we encourage better collaboration than maybe what would happen naturally? And additionally, I study leadership in organizations uh, really because kind of literally nothing gets accomplished without leadership. So leadership I see as a force that can make or break collaboration success. And so in particular, my research program focuses on the functioning and effectiveness of teams as well as bigger systems, uh, the bigger ecosystems or organizational level factors uh, that drive the assembly of teams, uh, particular scientific teams, and also I study leadership, emergence, effectiveness, and development. So one example of my kind of scientist practitioner approach to conducting research is that we have an ongoing project with NASA it's called Project Fusion. And what we're doing in this project is we're conducting a series of research studies that are kind of iterative 
that involve both really controlled laboratory experiments at my lab here at UVA, as well as in this capsule that you see on the screen, which is at Johnson Space Center. It's a human exploration research analog capsule that volunteers live in this tiny thing for 45 days and they're essentially our, our research subjects and we, and we investigate their collaboration processes. So we, we conduct controlled laboratory experiments. We scan archival documents and conduct interviews and observations with personnel. And we're also creating agent-based computational models, which is simply like a simulation of how people might operate in a big organization. Uh, but what we're doing is we're, through this iterative process, through this iterative research process, our goal is to identify and develop countermeasures or interventions, like how can we help uh, to support the collaboration processes that are going to be needed during long duration missions to deep space destinations like Mars. We know that they're achieving a major goal, like sending a team of humans to the surface of Mars is going to require collaboration on kind of an unprecedented scale. But we also know there's going to be a lot of barriers, for example, as that team far travels further to deep space they're going to have longer and longer communication delays where they used to be able to rely heavily on mission control for kind of momentary feedback that might take 15, 20 minutes or you know more than that. So we're trying to help by using our scientific approach to understand the situation, develop interventions and offer those interventions to the organization. I also look at kind of organizational level interventions like how could universities better support interdisciplinary collaboration uh, across different disciplines and, and backgrounds. And I also work directly with kind of senior leaders of organizations. So another project that's funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, what my colleagues and I are doing is we go into the senior layers of organizations. So meaning the CEO, the C-suite members, the top management team members, and those next level leaders. And we first identify who these folks are, and we have kind of conversations with the CEO, and we better understand kind of what is what does the CEO see as the strategy? How does the CEO see these different groups and individuals? How do they need to be working together? And then we actually survey those people, and we give them what's called a social network survey, which is we give them a roster of all of the other survey participants, and we say, okay, now who do you trust? Who do you actually work with collect collaboratively? Who do you rely on for leadership, really? And so, for example, with a, a leadership relationship, you might expect that what you see on the screen here is the way that organizations actually operate, where we've got the CEO in the middle, the arrows from this person to this person means that this person, TM, happens to rely on the CEO for leadership, like they accept their influence. Uh, the CEO is the most influential, and then these next, this next group of people are the top management team, and then the orange, the operations team, they report to this person, the sales the reports to this person, the HR reports to that person, the finance people report to that person. That's about how you might expect it to happen if you were just purely looking at the organizational chart. But when we actually ask these people, who do you really rely on for leadership? we see something very different. This is the actual pattern of leadership relationships as perceived by these employees. And so this is what we do in this project. We kind of, we go in and we diagnose what's actually happening below the surface in terms of who relies on whom for leadership, who trusts whom, who is working well with whom. And then we don't show this exactly to the CEO, but we provide summaries of kind of, here's what's actually happening in terms of uh, some insight about what you know the the functioning of your of your organization could be improved in x y and z ways based on our analyses so in this way this is a very research-based approach to providing specific actionable feedback to senior leaders and organizations and in fact uh, in this or in this study this is an example based on the feedback we gave to a ceo six months ago this is a recent case study that we did uh, the CEO essentially revised the entire organizational strategy. One thing we found is that the CEO uh, himself, in that case, uh, believed that the organization should be prioritizing growth and expansion, or I'm sorry, operations and kind of doing things correctly, whereas uh, quite a few other leaders actually wanted to prioritize growth and expansion. And so they realized that they're seeing things very differently and they need to find a compromise. And so they actually rearticulated what the organizational strategy was, which was 
we want to expand, but we want to do so in a kind of coherent way that also prioritizes operations. So in summary, that's why I study leadership and teamwork. I think it's a really important topic that has relevance to kind of all sorts of different organizations. We all need to work collaboratively together nowadays, but it's very often a struggle to do so. But more broadly, I have, based on my own career experience, I have these three bits of advice <laughs> to give. So number one is seeking out great mentors. For me personally, I ha would have no way in the world without the people that have, been, have mentored me. Uh, number two, as others have said, keep an open mind and take risks. You know, try new things and find out what you might be interested in. And then finally, I think it's important particularly if you're going into IO psychology to think about how you can help. So how could you be taking the science that were the, the expertise and the skill set that we're developing in this field and actually applying it to make the world a better place? Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. Now I'll ask our pa panelists to give us one final comment what they wish they knew before they entered grad school or perhaps just another insightful um, comment. Um, I guess we'll start with you, Tyler. Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. Um, I, I think what I would give as an example here, <laughs> sorry, lights just popped off, but uh, what I would give is, is, is like one final piece of advice. It's just like find what you like and what inspires you and do it. Um, you know, as IOs, we, we spend a lot of time looking at, um, you know, motivation, and we know that one of the biggest things that helps motivate folks is intrinsically motivating, uh, you know, being intrinsically motivated to do something. Um, that means not just doing something because your parents think you should do it, not just doing something because, uh, you know, you, you think this other career thing might be, um, you know, lucrative, but doing something because you genuinely want to do it and doing something because it genuinely interests you is going to be how you find a, a really, really long uh, and, 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 and important career. Um, I, I can just, uh, it's interesting because I started my kind of IO psychology journey not wanting to uh, be like a, a therapist or not really wanting to be that involved with someone. But just last week, I actually was consulting a client uh, within Under Armour, and she was really kind of spending a lot of time telling me about the issue that they were having. And after we worked through it and we peeled back the onion a bit and found what the root cause was, she said she felt like she just went through therapy. And it's funny because sometimes as an IO, you don't realize you're doing this, but you're using the skills. You're, you're, you're like using this knowledge we have about people and how organizations work and how people work together to get to the root cause. And you might, it might be therapeutic for some folks to be able to kind of work through that. So just find what you like, and I'm sure you will find happiness that goes along with it. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tyler. Sasha? Yeah, um, I would just say uh, keep an open mind. and know that sometimes you need to take two steps back to get three steps forward. Um, and that is something that I think I live by now at this point. Um, so whether that is taking the, the unpaid internship, maybe that is working a couple extra hours here and there, um, it really does pay out at the end. Um, and that's something I wish that, you know, really people had pushed me to understand. I always thought like, oh, it's shiny, it's a great name, and that's what I should be attracted to. But it's keeping that open mind and realizing that um, if you build the right networks around you and you really think about what is that long-term goal or short-term goal you have in the next 5, 10, 20 years, um, how can you get there? But sometimes maybe needing to take that step back in order to get there. Thank you, Sasha. Neil? Yeah, so I'll keep mine sh super short and sweet. Um, so the first one is you do not need a doctorate to do a lot of things in IO psychology, um, maybe with the exception of being an academic. Um, so don't let that stop you if you feel like uh, I, I can't or there's just it's just not logistically feasible for me to, to, to do the PhD. The, the field has changed a lot in the past past few years and there's so many opportunities and very cool work that you've heard about already uh, that you can do with the master's level uh, in IO psychology. Uh, the second thing is, um, uh, Dorothy said this, um, Sasha just said this as well, but take risks. Um, taking risks has always served me well, especially earlier in my career when maybe it didn't feel like um, this really made sense on paper or it wasn't sort of the job title that I'd always thought was the, the job title to go for. but 
stepping out in that and stepping up to the challenge and taking a risk has always served me well. So I encourage you to do that too. Thank you, Neil. Ruth? My key advice is just never underestimate the power and the value of relationship building. Sometimes it's not always what you know, but who you know. And that has served me very well over the years. And at the end of the day, we're all practitioners, you're going to be a practitioner. So it's good to have a network of folks that you can rely on and you can just email like, hey, I'm struggling with this in my organization. Have you seen this? Like, what would you do? And it's never a resource that is going to just be wasteful. Make sure that you reach out to folks and you know, continue networking always. Okay, thank you, Ruth. Is he? And this advice I think is for life in general, but also for IO, always ask questions, always ask for help. Always share your struggles because I guarantee you, whether it's good or it's bad, someone else has been there. When you're having a struggle, if you share that with others, they can talk through what they did and how they surpassed it. And that can give you ideas for what you can do. So always be open when you're having difficulties and challenges. On the other side of that, when things are going well, share that with others too, because these might be good conversations about where your passion lies. And when you're in a good place of uh, headspace that you can figure out what should I be doing with my life? So this kind of goes back to what people have said before, rely on other people, build those relationships, build that relationship with yourself, right? What do I want? What do I need? And then do that for other people. IO is a very small world. And so you will have help and you will have others to support you. So learn to do that now. Thank you, Izzy. Dorothy? Uh, so I'm going to say an academic answer. There's a publication that operationalizes star performers, right? And organizations. And it's published in the Journal of Applied Psychology, which is kind of our top journal in our field. And what they say is that a star performer is somebody who has the past performance. They're doing a really great job. They also have that social capital that Bruce and Sasha are, are pointing it to. They really pay attention to their network and building relationships and, you know, making positive relationships happen with, with other folks, as well as they've got some sort of their name is out there in some way. So they put themselves out there in ways that other people can, can notice. Uh, but I think all three of those are, are extremely important and you need to have all three in terms of being really successful, in, in terms of being able to make a really big impact in the field. And so that first one, let's not forget it too, uh, it's the idea that you've been a lifelong learner and you're really trying to develop your own expertise. I think there's so much information out there on IO psychology topics. It's always like kind of a flood of new new papers, new information from um, you know, the Wall Street Journal, that sort of thing. So it's kind of approaching your career as you're always going to be a student in pursuit of developing your expertise. Thank you, Dorothy. Well, in closing, I want to say many thanks to our panelists for sharing their careers in IO psychology. What an exciting array of careers. I hope you all have enjoyed today's presentations as much as I have. If you would like to learn more about a career in IO psychology, contact us. Visit the APA Office of Applied Psychology, our APA Division 14, which is the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, also known as SIOP. On the SIOP website, you'll find information on industrial organizational psychology and IO grad programs. At the APA Office of Applied Psychology website, you'll find links to other careers in applied psychology. For more information on IO psychology, check out these two books um, in the SIOP Professional Practice Series. Mastering Industrial Organizational Psychology has everything you need to know about IO graduate school, and Mastering the Job Market has a wealth of information on careers in IO psychology. Goodbye, and good luck pursuing your career in applied psychology. <laughs>